Welcome to the Zephyr Mini Summit 2020. Warm welcome to those of you Zephyr developers. We would not be here without you, so thank you for your contributions. Also, welcome to those of you who are new to Zephyr. We hope this talk will provide enough ammunition for you to get started with your own Zephyr project. All right, we have a great agenda lined up for you. I will be going over Zephyr project, overall what the project entitles. Then my, pro my colleagues from Zephyr project will join me and walk you through with some of the key topics, communication stacks, our release plans, security and safety for Zephyr, and we will have a use case example at the end for you. At the very end, very end we'll have about 15 minutes Q&A. If you have any questions throughout the talk, feel free to start entering your questions on the top right corner, and we'll do best we can to answer, but we will also have a panel at the end. With that, let's get started. One common question we get is why Zephyr? Was there a really need for another RTOS while there are so many choices out there? Based on our research, we believe that how the market was evolving for constrained devices, there was a real need for open source, open governance, and full featured real-time OS. The low end of the stacks were extremely fragmented. And there was a good, there was a need to secure endpoints so it can be used for safety critical applications. And that is why Zephyr was created. And we have uh, really strong ambitions and goals to make the Zephyr as a best in class real time OS. Zephyr project has been around about four years. We started around 2016. Right from the start, Zephyr was an open source project with mutual governance. It is permissively licensed under Apache 2.0, so you as a contributor can retain your copyright. And this was the goal, because we wanted to develop and we wanted to build a strong community. If there's an, um, right, go back. And if there's an architect, um, yeah, great, thank you. So Zephyr from the beginning, we wanted to, we wanted to be in the smallest of the devices, and we continued adding features and bringing new architectures. At the same time, we're keeping the footprint very small. That is why Zephyr to be uh, Zephyr was designed from design point of view, modular and, and configurable. So if you have specific features, you can bring in and out of the kernel. So this is up to you as a developer. Zephyr aims to be a scalable solution developed cooperatively in the open that integrates all of its functionality around a common API and primitives. And we can't, you can't just call yourself open source uh, project without the key principles of what the open source project entitles. So Zephyr in that sense is a truly open source project. And we, our goal is to empower our developers and build a strong community. And sure enough, we have built a strong, vibrant community and this community is bringing great products into market. So if we start moving forward, and these are the products that we see in the market uh, today. I'll call out, it, the interesting about Zephyr is it's an open source embedded um, RTOS. So we don't get to see all the products uh, out there. So it's a little bit of detective work, but these are some of the good examples here. A few of them that I want to call out is that OB4 in the corner, um, it's uh, it's using Zephyr. It's a radio by Teenage Engineering. It's actually already sold out. I'd love to get my own one when it's getting back in the market. Another one is the distancer 
with the pandemic world we live in right now, it's a small device using Zephyr, helping police to keep the required social distance so that they can still be productive in their work environment. Actually, my favorite one is one of the early on Zephyr projects that Grush Gaming Brush. Uh, it's making my kids' bedtime routine a lot more enjoyable and a lot more fun. So again, Zephyr is targeted at the constrained low power devices and these products are good testament uh, of that. So if you look at the architectures, you'll see the key architectures are represented here. This is actually the main reason and one of the important reasons that Google joined Zephyr project community. You have Intel, you have uh, Arc, ARM, and it's exciting to see we have Spark and Open Power in the pipeline. If you don't see any architect the architectures of your choice in this list, uh, please consider this an invitation. We welcome you to join us, join the Zephyr community, work with the community, get it upstream, and add it to this list. We'd love to see that. One of the exciting things that we see right now is a lot of the development boards started shipping Zephyr as a default OS. This lowers the barrier to entry and play with Zephyr and allowing you as a developer to quickly get started with Zephyr and get involved. So we'd love to see much more um, developer boards in this, uh, in this list. This is an example of it. And in fact, if we move to the next slide, we have about 200 boards, more than 200 boards, and this list continues to grow that is enabled for Zephyr. This, this is just an example of list. If you go to the Zephyr site, you will have the full list of your choice. What does it tell you as a developer? There is a wealth of board choices for you. Not only there's a functional platform, but there is a range of solutions for your choice. Boards are all about getting you started. You can find the lowest price point with the good functionality boards from this list and quickly get started with Zephyr. So don't wait, just get started. And now let's take a look at Zephyr's architecture. From the beginning, we wanted full functionality OS for constrained devices. That was the, the one of the key goals. Another fundamentals was Zephyr founding principle was safety and security. So this was a very proactive approach for security. Zephyr basically sits between bare metal and full featured operating system. What makes Zephyr special is that it's full featured, full structure, and good architecture with a strong community. So you, as a developer, can focus on your applications and not worry about other things. I know this block diagram looks overwhelming, uh, and then you can barely some of the, um, the blocks here. But I'd like, what I would like you to take away from this is Zephyr is highly configurable, it's modular architecture and designed to expand and accommodate new functionalities. So you can fine tune features and parameters based on the needs of your hardware um, platform requirements. Memory uh, resources are statically allocated, so you can get a good idea up front what is the upper bound of what your OS memory consumptions will be, and you can plan for it. And something uh, that I want to call out here is Zephyr has a niche, rich networking stack and the Bluetooth, uh, Bluetooth stack. And we have these uh, details available on the Zephyr site and getting started. Uh, section as well. Let's take a look at Zephyr ecosystem. So at the core, you have the OS itself, Zephyr OS, with three layers. 
you have the kernel hardware abstraction layer with the smallest footprint, kernel objects, services, low level architecture, everything you need at the low le lowest level. Then on top of that is sitting the uh, OS, service, OS services, basically your networking stack, IP stack, Bluetooth stack, crypto libraries. Then at the highest layer is the application services high level networking protocols, higher level objects you can take advantage of. Outside the OS, we have the software development kit, device management and bootloader. And then of course, the, the community that we have built and we're proud of. Next. So when we, when we say Zephyr project, it's more than just the kernel. Zephyr has broad goals and we aim to provide soup to nuts menu for your firmware development. And we're building a robust ecosystem with this goal. So let's, uh, let's take a look at what are the uh, applications or tools available to you in the next slide. So on top, you'll see based on the architecture, uh, you have NXPs and Nordic, and synopsis is um, architecture-based development environments. Then you have architecture vendor agnostic development tools in the, the middle. And then we also have a slew of debug tools in, for various platforms as well. So you have a great set of development tools as you get started with Zephyr. From firmware and middleware applications perspective, we see that machine learning applications are coming down to these resource constrained devices. So it's exciting to see that Google, uh, Google TensorFlow Lite team has integrated Zephyr. So uh, at the end, my colleague Michael will go de deeper into this one. We have Python and JavaScript. We're bringing these popular programming languages to uh, Zephyr and the community around, the, uh, around this as well. And Zephyr comes with the integrated boot firmware, MCU boot. And you also have security oriented middleware that is available. So with all these tools um, and the firmware, we are focusing on the training and consulting services. Training is one of the key areas that we will be focusing on coming months. You can find getting started guide, tutorials, and documents already available on the Zephyr site. We have some of the consultant partners of the Zephyr offering training and as part of their services as well. And the right uh, on the Linux side, you also have a Zep free Zephyr class to get you started. From uh, consulting, we have few partners. Actually, Antimicro is a, a Zephyr, Zephyr member. They provide consulting engineering services. Google works closely with them and open source tools uh, as well. And we have Bay Libra and few other uh, partners here. And Blue Clover device, devices offering tester you can you have they offer uh, version control testing plans and results can be easily uh, integrated into uh, into the cloud so that you have these services also available at your fingertips to get you started with all these robust ecosystem we as i mentioned we have a strong community if we look at on the next slide and this data was pulled from the GitHub. In past two weeks, merely the past two weeks, there are 1,600 people uniquely cloning Zephyr. These are the people using Zephyr for real projects and their development uh, efforts. As an open source project, we take great pride on the community we have um, built and we have come a long way in the past few, uh, few years. We have built a diverse, uh, diverse contributors in terms of upstreaming features and changes. 
as you take a look at this from where we started in 2016 and where we are today, number of authors, we have 45,000 commits sitting right now. And the boards, as I mentioned earlier, in the very beginning, we had one board for per architecture. Now that catalog has grown them to 200 plus boards and this continues to, to grow. And the community continues to grow as well. And we're, we, we collaborate closely. We have active, engaged um, in people in Twitter, LinkedIn, and the cooperating on Slack as well. So in summary, Zephyr is an open source and mutual governance real-time OS with a strong community. It's offering full-featured modular RTOS for you to get started. And we have, a, we have built a robust ecosystem around it. So we look at open source as a, as a uh, common good for all of us. All of us around the globe from the industry have obligations to come together and build a great open source that all of us can utilize. So we continue to put our efforts in and we welcome you to join us in this community and push Zephyr's technologies move forward. So this is where we are as a Zephyr overview. Now I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Johan, to walk us through the, the communication stacks. Johan, take it away. All right, thanks, Barna. So uh, my name is Johan Hedberg. I uh, work for Intel. I've been part of the Zephyr project ever since it, it went public uh, many years ago. And I prim primarily spend my time uh, maintaining the Bluetooth stack there, but uh, I've been working closely with the team that's responsible for many other uh, communication technologies. So the idea uh, with uh, my part of this uh, presentation is to go through the various communi communication stacks that we have in Zephyr and uh, uh, tell you about the current state of them. So next slide, yeah. Um, so let's uh, start with the IP stack. Well, uh, first of all, I, I would like to say that one of the kind of core uh, philosophies with Zephyr from the very beginning has been that we don't only want to be the, the core uh, kernel where uh, people creating products have to go and find various uh, networking stacks or other subsystems to, to make a complete product. Rather, we want to provide those as part of the, uh, the, the Zephyr offering. And as such, uh, from the very beginning, we have had an IP stack in, in Zephyr. Now, uh, when we started, we were uh, trying hard to fight against this uh, not invented here syndrome. So we uh, looked through the uh, existing uh, embedded IP stacks, uh, uh, open source IP stacks uh, that were available. And we ended up originally using the stack from an uh, RTOS called uh, Contiki. And uh, that one was working pretty well for a while. But then we realized that we were adapting it so much to Zephyr and, and it ended up changing so much in Zephyr that we couldn't really upstream the changes and it became very hard to maintain. Uh, at which point we made the decision that it makes more sense to implement uh, a fully uh, native IP stack for, for Zephyr. And that's what we've had now in the project for uh, several years. And uh, in terms of features, um, we think that we have pretty much everything that you need for a typical Internet of Things node type of embedded device and, and many features beyond that as well. So the, uh, the IP stack that we have, it supports both IPv4 and IPv6. Uh, it supports address uh, auto configuration uh, for both of those with the various protocols uh, that are available for that. Uh, we uh, also support uh, industrial use cases, um, like the time sensitive networks with the precision time protocol uh, where we sp also support master and grandmaster roles and then things also like 8021 qav then uh, as the uh, main application interface for the ip stack uh, we have the standard bsd sockets api 
So that should make it fairly easy to port existing applications that uh, use BSD sockets on, on the Zephyr. And we've done that ourselves, for example, with the uh, Civit web uh, library uh, that implements a sophisticated HTTP client and server. Um, then uh, also to, to simplify uh, uh, the application developer work for uh, doing secure uh, applications, we've uh, extended the uh, uh, sockets API with, with a non-standard uh, set, set sock opt call for doing TLS uh, as well. I think we uh, uh, copied this from Linux, so it's not a completely from scratch invention there. Uh, then, uh, since we have the uh, sockets uh, API, uh, we actually have the possibility of supporting offloaded IP stacks as well. So there exists um, solutions where you have the IP stack on, on a completely separate uh, chip, and there's a higher level interface that you talk to that uh, chip with. And uh, as long as you're using the, uh, the the sockets API in Zephyr, we can actually abstract that away. So you don't need to know if you're using the native uh, IP stack in Zephyr, or if you're using something that's offloaded to another uh, another chip. And then, uh, lastly, I'd like to mention that uh, we've done since this was a stack implemented from scratch. We've done fairly extensive uh, compliance and security testing on it to to be sure that there are no uh, no really bad bugs in it. So uh, we've been using this test suite called uh, Maxwell Pro for uh, doing the compliance. And then also um, a suite called uh, Defensix uh, for uh, doing uh, fast testing and, and that kind of stuff. So uh, this has given us a fairly good level of confidence that the stack is uh, on a very good uh, robustness uh, level and compliance level. So next slide, please. So let's look at the a uh, little bit more higher level features or rather uh, application use cases that you can do. Uh, with the uh, uh, Zephyr stack. So we have your uh, typical application uh, level uh, protocols that you would want to have in IoT devices like um, uh, Co-op and uh, MQTT. Uh, then of course, we have support for uh, traditional uh, HTTP as well. And uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, the uh, we were using the Civit web library to implement this uh, using an existing uh, solution that uses the uh, uh, the sockets uh, API. We also have a native HTTP client in uh, in Zephyr as well as a WebSocket uh, client. Then uh, to help with uh, corporate use cases where you're sitting behind a firewall and you want to test your Zephyr implementation, we have uh, SOX5 support so you can actually get through your uh, firewall, your corporate firewall, and, and do testing with the wider internet. Uh, lightweight machine-to-machines uh, is another thing that uh, we've actually been doing demos at uh, earlier conferences uh, with, with Zephyr there. And uh, thread support is something that we also got a few years ago uh, using the uh, OpenThread project, which is quite widely used. Then uh, about the uh, various uh, technologies, uh, uh, we support uh, Different, there are a couple of boards in Zephyr which have Ethernet adapters on them. So we have drivers for those, and you can get uh, network connectivity uh, with that. Uh, we have the possibility of uh, building an application with Zephyr that makes it an uh, USB Ethernet uh, adapter, basically. Uh, we have uh, uh, Wi Fi with uh, IP offload support, which uh, I, I mentioned earlier. Then there's a bunch of uh, technologies with uh, six low uh, support that we can use six low with. Uh, the most common one probably is the uh, 802.15.4, but we also have the uh, the IP stack in Zephyr uh, integrating together with the Bluetooth stack for having uh, six low band support for uh, Bluetooth LE. So you can do IP links over Bluetooth in that that sense. And uh, CAN bus is, is a fairly recent uh, addition to that. And uh, another recent addition is also a point-to-point -point protocol support to be able to work with uh, external modems. So then uh, another uh, quite important uh, communication, uh, wireless communication technology we have is, is uh, Bluetooth. And that's something we've supported from the very beginning. Uh, although uh, when Zephyr launched, I think we only had the host support, the, the controller side came a little bit later. 
But on the host side, uh, we've been working hard to keep uh, the stack compliant with the very latest uh, specifications. Uh, I mentioned here that it's uh, 5.1 compliant, but we've actually got features already from the 5.2 uh, specification uh, of Bluetooth as well. The uh, primary use case as, as Zephyr targets small embedded devices uh, with uh, constrained uh, resources, Bluetooth low energy, low energy is the most natural fit for those. But uh, we've also wanted to uh, support uh, Bluetooth Classic, uh, in case somebody wants to build a device using that and, and uh, has some use cases for that. But that's ever since it was introduced, it's actually been uh, flagged as experimental because there, there are no uh, major boards in Zephyr that support Bluetooth Classic. So most of what, what I'll be talking about relates to Bluetooth Low Energy here. Um, the, uh, the host side of Zephyr, it's using the standard uh, host uh, controller interface, which is uh, specified in the Bluetooth core specification. And uh, there's a bunch of standard transports uh, for that. So, so physical uh, communication transports for the host to talk to the Bluetooth controller. Uh, the common ones are uh, UART. So we support both uh, uh, with the software flow control as well, well as with hardware flow, uh, flow control, uh, UART. Uh, then uh, we have support for uh, uh, USB as well, and uh, a few others uh, of the HR transports. And there's a fairly clean abstraction for this, but it's quite easy to add uh, new ones if you have uh, use cases for that. Then uh, in order to make uh, and uh, sell a Bluetooth product, uh, you need to go through this process called uh, Bluetooth qualification. And we try to make it as easy as possible for companies wanting to build products out of Zephyr. Uh, by making sure, first of all, that it's uh, it passes all the qualifi uh, qualification tests all the time. But in addition, the Zephyr project itself has actually gone through the process of qualifying and creating a so-called qualification listing on uh, the Bluetooth.org website, where you can then uh, simply refer to that listing as part of creating your uh, qualified product. And uh, the last release that we did this for was the LT uh, LTS release uh, last year. There has been subsequent qualifications of uh, newer Zephyr versions as well, but those have so far been done by member companies. They can uh, still be reused in the same way. It's just it's not done in the name of the uh, Linux Foundation. And uh, our plan is to qualify the next LTS release as well, which is uh, coming next year. And uh, one of the features of the Bluetooth stack, uh, since we have the standard HI transport support, is, is that we can actually do different kinds of builds of it. So you can build the host alone and then expect to have the controller available through some physical uh, transport. Uh, you can build the controller alone and then have it provide uh, the physical transport to host somewhere else. Or you can combine these together in, into what we call a combined build, where there's still uh, your standard HI messaging going on between the host and the controller. Uh, but uh, it's all done in uh, runtime memory. So we uh, encode things into network buffers, and then the controller decodes them, and, and vice versa when data is coming from the controller to the host. Uh, ever since we started uh, developing the stack, uh, we've had more and more companies joining it. And uh, it's quite uh, diverse right now, which I think is very healthy uh, for, for the project. So there's not a single company that would be uh, dominating the development of, of the Bluetooth support. So, so that's a good thing. The uh, Bluetooth mesh support is uh, something that is one of the most recent additions. And uh, we uh, kind of pride ourselves in, in that the Bluetooth Special Interest Group has taken both the mesh implementation as well as the, uh, the, the whole stack itself uh, to be used in its reference material. So if you go to the Bluetooth.org website and, and you look for uh, developer guides uh, for creating Bluetooth applications, it's actually using Zephyr as, as a reference there. So that's a good starting point for somebody wanting to do, uh, develop uh, Bluetooth applications with Zephyr. So next, yeah. So a little bit about the uh, the Bluetooth uh, controller support. Uh, first of all, this is a fairly uh, recent thing in the industry to have uh, at all a uh, open an open source uh, Bluetooth controller implementation. Uh, I think five years ago, uh, none of this existed, and then suddenly, uh, at the time when Zephyr started uh, gaining traction, there were a couple of implementations uh, that 
came came to be. And one of these was contributed by Nordic Semiconductor to, to Zephyr. And uh, we actually have the second uh, generation of that going on now. So the first uh, Bluetooth core implementation we had in Zephyr, that was quite strictly tied to uh, Nordic Semiconductor's hardware. In principle, you could have adapted that to other radios as well, but it was fairly complex. But uh, now we have something uh, called a uh, split uh, link layer in Zephyr, which uh, splits it into the upper and lower parts. And, and the primary purpose of this is to allow um, creating new implementations of the lower link layer that adapts to different kinds of uh, radio uh, radios. So you can actually use the Bluetooth controller on more than just a single uh, piece of hardware from one vendor. And we already now have support for more than the, the original Nordic uh, NRF5 family. So we have uh, the, the Vega board support, RISC-5, and uh, then there are um, companies who are working downstream from Zephyr that uh, have adapted that to their hardware as well. But uh, at least so far, this uh, this implementation isn't upstream. But already the fact that we have like uh, two, three implementations has given us good feedback to know that the abstraction that's there between the lower and upper link layers is uh, fairly good and uh, flexible. Another thing, of course, that's uh, important when we want to support different architectures is uh, to be conscious of what's the uh, native Indianness uh, of the architecture that you're running on. And, uh, this is something we have supported from the very beginning, that we don't make any assumptions of the uh, Indianness of the host CPU architecture. So it, it will work both on big and little Indian uh, machines. The, uh, uh, the way that the interface is designed is that, is that the procedures are uh, all uh, asynchronous, so we're not blocking up uh, operations and, and, and any uh, Thing, any procedures that are uh, taking a longer amount of time. And uh, the second uh, generation of the controller is extremely efficient also in uh, utilizing uh, the radio, that there's very little uh, waste uh, if you do an analysis of, uh, if you're asking it to do multiple things like serve multiple connections and do uh, Bluetooth low energy advertising and so on, it's very efficiently using the available bandwidth there and, and the time. And uh, when you're not using it anything, the uh, usage is, is very low, the, the CPU consumption. So that, that's a good property of it as well. And uh, there are really no hard-coded limits on uh, the kind of use cases that you want to do, how many uh, connections you want to support, or how many uh, advertiser or scanner instances you have. So in practice, uh, these are simply limited by how much uh, runtime memory you have, and then what uh, the actual uh, timing constraints are. So how much time each uh, instance requires for itself. So uh, this allows uh, fairly flexible uh, implementations and use cases to be done. Next slide. So then uh, lastly, one more uh, technology, I guess, which, which you could call a communications uh, technology is uh, USB support. We have uh, primarily uh, started off with the device side, since that's what your embedded systems would normally uh, want to support. Uh, and uh, we have support for uh, several different MCU families with uh, USB device support. So this the uh, SD Micro, the Kinetis uh, Nordics support, as well as uh, Atmel's uh, devices. And uh, we have full USB 2.0 support supporting both uh, full and uh, high speed. And we have various uh, classes of USB devices that you can create out of, out of Zephyr. So I think I mentioned earlier that you can do um, an Ethernet controller uh, out of Zephyr. Uh, we support mass storage. So we have uh, the FAT file system support in Zephyr, and you can export that through USB to your PC, for example. Um, we have HID support, so you can do, uh, if you have a Zephyr board which has accelerometers in it, you could implement a 3D mouse or something like that using a HID. Uh, device firmware update is another thing that's supported. And then, of course, uh, Bluetooth. So there's a, a sample application in the tree that you can build that creates a standard um, USB Bluetooth adapter out of, out of Zephyr. You can plug that into uh, your PC, and it will just show up automatically. And uh, all of this is uh, tightly integrated with, with the main operating system, which means that it's a uh, very low uh, footprint. 
Uh, another nice thing that we have in the USB stack is the uh, flexible descriptor uh, instance in which uh, allows you to make uh, multifunctional USB devices. Uh, a couple of additional uh, nice things uh, we, we have uh, demos that we have uh, done is uh, we have support for the uh, native POSIX platform where you can run Zephyr as a uh, uh, native application in, in uh, Linux. Uh, and you can do USB development through that. And we also have a sample for uh, web USB. And uh, yeah, that's, that's what I have for the communication. So let's... Uh, go to the next topic. Thanks, Johan. Um, my name is Maureen Helm. I work for NXP, and I, uh, I've been working on Zephyr for a number of years now, um, working as a maintainer uh, for NXP platforms in the ARM architecture, uh, as well as uh, um, a member of the technical steering committee. So I'm going to spend the next few minutes uh, giving an overview of releases, both our, our, our mainline releases, as well as our uh, long-term long -term support releases. So next slide, please. All right, so starting off with our main run, mainline releases, um, this is kind of where all the, the main development happens in Zephyr. Um, we have adopted a, a, a release cadence of every four months um, based uh, are built off of the main or master branch of the Git tree. Uh, our most recent release was made just over a month ago, back at toward the end of September. This was our 2.4 release. Um, and we are actively working on our next release, which is 2.5, scheduled for January of 2021. Um, there are two parts to the release cycle. The, the majority of that time is spent in what we call the merge window open stage. Um, this is where all of the, the main activity happens, right? This is you know, we're merging new features, adding enhancements, bug fixes, documentation, you name it. This is this is the bulk of the, the development or where the development happens in Zephyr. Now, the last three or so weeks of the release cycle, we then back off a little bit and try to stabilize things before we actually finalize the release. And so this is our stabilization period. And what we do during this period is we, we slow down the, the merging of um, features and enhancements, um, and we instead focus on bug fixes and docu documentation, any kind of release-related um, patches. Um, we do allow for exceptions. If there's a new feature that was, was close to being ready or, or just barely missed it, we do have a process um, where if somebody still wants to get that in, they can take that to the technical steering committee and request uh, an exception. Um, now, during that time, even though we are generally not merging new features and enhancements, uh, it is important to remember that the community is more than welcome to continue submitting things to continue submitting pull requests for new features and enhancements. They can still be submitted. They can still be reviewed. Although that being said, sometimes the you know reviewers are are, are much are more involved in the the release process, so they may not have a whole lot of bandwidth to review your patches, but that process can still continue going forward during the stabilization period. Um, now, what signals the start of that period is the release manager rule tag, then RC1, or release candidate one uh, tag, and that signals when we stop accepting new features into the tree. Um, we'll, as we go through that, we'll, we'll iterate. So for each release candidate, we'll then kick off a bunch of regression testing. Various member companies have board farms where they'll go run regression testing on physical hardware um, and then submit new bugs that may have been found during that, that testing period. And so we'll, we'll do that several times. Usually we'll get to an RC1, RC2, RC3 states. Um, where we finally um, take a look at, uh, we have a set of release quality criteria that determines whether the release is actually ready to go. And this consists of looking at the total number of bugs that we have outstanding that haven't been resolved. So uh, we generally classify bugs as high, medium, or low priority. And then finally, after the release is actually complete, we do have mechanisms for uh, backporting fixes. Um, so if security vulnerabilities are identified, we will backport fixes to the two most recent releases. Next slide, please. 
Now shifting gears a little bit, the other type of release we have is our long-term support or LTS release. Um, this release is targeted more towards uh, production and long-term support. So we, the Zephyr project made our very first LTS release uh, back in the spring of 2019. This was our LTS one or the 1.14.0 release. Um, we are actively working towards our next LTS release, which will be about two years after the initial LTS release. And so that will be our 2.6 um, plan for May of 2021. Now, during the, the, this, the that two year support period, uh, we will backport fixes for security vulnerabilities, bug fixes, um, and things like that uh, for the, the, the entire course of the two years. Um, we've done two of these to date. Uh, we've done a 1.14.1 in October of 2019, and then we did a, a dot two in April of 2020. And we do these as needed based on um, any kind of bugs or, or security vulnerabilities that, are, that get identified. Um, it's important to remember that uh, we, we, we do work toward maintaining any API compatibility here. So that this will, you know, taking an LTS um, update won't impact your, your higher level applications. Next slide, please. Um, a little bit about how these releases actually happen. We have a group of um, highly active maintainers in the project um, that we call our release engineering team. This consists of about six to eight people uh, represented by different members, member companies. So this isn't just one company managing all the releases. We, we, we work hard to share the load across the member companies. Now this release engineering team is, are the people that are responsible for merging code changes. So as pull requests during both, during the, um, the, the merge window open period of a general release, um, it's the release engineering team will that, that will actually merge pull requests into the uh, upstream main or master branch. Uh, this team meets weekly to triage uh, new bugs that get reported and monitor fixes that come in and, and, and actively work toward um, getting those bug counts down as the, the release cycle progresses. This team also keeps an eye on the continuous integration. So those of you that have contributed to Zephyr know that uh, we do a lot of continuous integration. We do a lot of build testing across the 200 plus boards um, that we have supported upstream in Tree. Um, we have nightly builds, a lot of build testing to try to make sure that we keep that master branch uh, in a buildable state. Uh, the release team also is responsible for reviewing backports toward that LTS branch. And so each week in our release meeting, uh, we'll take a look at any new backports that have been um, submitted for the LTS branch. Um, and, and, and those backports first have to be accepted into the master branch. And once that happens, we'll make sure that we have reported um, a bug report for that backport fix and then um, if that team agrees that it should be back included in the LTS then we'll go ahead and merge it. Um, within the release engineering team uh, we have a release manager role. Uh, this is a rotating role by release and so each each re new release will select a new release manager and this is a pretty critical responsibility and so that's why we kind of try to share the load. And, and this person is, is really responsible for kind of bringing that release through completion. They'll lead the weekly release team meetings. They will monitor all the bug counts. They will coordinate um, getting all the release notes ready to go from the, all the different subsystem maintainers. Um, they're the people that are the release manager is the person that actually makes the uh, or tags the, the Git tree and publishes uh, the candidates and announces them as well onto the, the mailing lists. Okay, next slide, please. So um, taking a look a bit into what kind of features we have planned, uh, both what, what's landed in our most recent release as well as some features that are coming in our next couple of releases leading up to LTS2. So as I said earlier, we had the 2.4 release just come out about a month ago. And so the highlights that came with that release were around, uh, firstly, some initial support for virtual memory management landed. Um, we saw 
some blue on the Bluetooth subsystem side of things. There was host support for um, some periodic advertisement and asynchronous channels. This is leading toward uh, LE audio support in a future release. Uh, for the networking subsystem, uh, the TC there is a new TCP implementation that was introduced a couple of releases ago, and we shifted that to be the default now in the 2.4 release. We saw a new tool chain abstraction land, and this is uh, an important uh, introductory milestone toward supporting additional tool chains. So historically, Zephyr has supported GCC-based tool chains. Um, but we are looking toward expanding that to things like LLVM Clang um, and proprietary tool chains like IR or RMCC. So this tool chain abstraction is a, is a stepping stone toward, toward that direction. Um, the, the, the last thing uh, that's important to note about the, the most recent release is uh, we, we made a concerted effort to reduce some technical debt. And so, as I mentioned before, when, when we make releases historically, we've, we've looked at bug counts. Um, you know, we've had basically just said, okay, there, have to, there can't be any outstanding high priority bugs. There's a, a threshold of low priority bugs. And we typically haven't had any kinds of thresholds uh, to gate releases based on the bug counts for low priority bugs. And this has led to a, a fairly large backlog of what we've classified as low priority bugs. And so for the 2.4 release, we made an effort to work down this technical debt. And so at the beginning of the release, I think we had somewhere on the order of 300 low priority bugs. Um, and we, we worked to bring that down to 150. Um, and then the, the goal is to, to continue working that down over the next two releases. And so by the time we get to LTS2, it will be a much more manageable number. Now, looking forward to uh, the, the 2.5 release, which is what we're actively working on right now, due in uh, the beginning of uh, Jan or due at the end of January in 2021. Um, there is a lot of activity going on right now around device tree and pin, pin muxing and standardizing that uh, across the different uh, vendors. Uh, it's, it's largely been around ARM, but we're, we're seeing that happen in, in various areas. Um, let's see, so there, there's also a goal to continue on that tool chain abstraction front and to have LLVM support on all applicable architectures. Um, I mentioned already technical debt. Now, this is then leading toward our LTS2 release in next May, which is our 2.6 release. Um, again, we'll continue working down that technical debt. Uh, as Johan mentioned, we will uh, re-qualify our Bluetooth host and mesh parts of the stack, and as well as um, working on uh, some safety-related coding guidelines compliance. And so Amber will talk about that here uh, in an upcoming part of this presentation. Um, now, as, as many of you know, doing uh, roadmaps in open source can be challenging. It's difficult sometimes to know what features are coming when. Um, so I did want to also highlight a number of, of, of features that are actively being working worked on, although we don't have uh, firm dates yet is when these things will actually be landing upstream. So if you're interested in, in any of these additional features, um, just wanted to bring awareness to those that they are coming. And if you want to contribute, um, you're definitely invited to do so. So I mentioned IR, there's uh, some sound open firmware work happening, SMP, uh, we, there are some uh, members that are interested in expanding that from x86 architecture and ARC architecture to also including our members five, as well as um, more uh, expanding support for power management. Okay, next slide, please. So I had the, uh, the, the, the privilege of being the release manager for the Zephyr 2.4 release. So I uh, wanted to take a, a quick look at uh, some of the st statistics that I found in this release. Um, and it's, it's, it's really exciting to see how much this community has grown over the years. So over the course of our, our uh, roughly four months, 113 days, we saw over 3,000 commits uh, land into the master branch uh, submitted by over 200 authors. Now, what I think is the most um, exciting statistic that I found looking through some of this data is that we had 83 new authors contribute 
patches and this release. And so, um, you know, welcome to everyone that has, has joined recently. We're really happy to have you. All right. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it. Oh, sorry, I forgot about my my resources slide. This is more for uh, for for future uh, reference. If offline after this presentation, if you want to learn some more about the topics that I've talked about, here's a slew of, of links you can go check out. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rude from Synopsis, who's going to talk about security. Thanks, Maureen. Indeed, let's talk security. My name is Ru Derwig. I'm working as a security yeah, or system uh, architect, but also focusing on security with Synopsys. I've been involved with Zephyr from the start uh, in various roles. Uh, so I'm the maintainer for the ar architecture, uh, representing Synopsys in the technical steering committee, and also member of the security committee. So that's the topic for this section of the summit. Now you can go to the next slide, Brad. Thank you. So um, Barnard introduced in their first slides the vision of the Zephyr project, uh, basically becoming the best in class articles. So how does that translate to security? Well, obviously, Zephyr wants to be the world's most secure articles. Um, but that's, that's not easy because it's targeting connected devices. And that basically means uh, you have a huge attack surface, or at least um, yeah, anyone can attack connected devices through the network links. Um, you don't need local access to the device to try and tamper with it. Um, next, the devices separate targets are resource constraints. So that basically means they are uh, cost sensitive. And uh, typically, that translates into uh, the products not wanting to spend effort, um, cost, uh, hardware area, uh, footprint, code space for security. Uh, so security has to be at no cost. Well, that's that's not that possible, but we try to minimize the impact there. Um, the last challenge is that attackers uh, keep evolving, right? Um, uh, that's a growing set of attacks, uh, but also the type of attacks uh, change over time. Uh, so tools for doing attacks become um, uh, readily available. And you can download the scripts for doing attacks. Um, and basically, that means that also on the defense side, devices need to be more and more clever and add more advanced countermeasures. Um, a security talk should always have some example of a recent attack. Uh, the one I picked, you see a picture on the right bottom, is Ripple 20. Um, so that is a attack vulnerability, maybe consisting of uh, 19. Uh, zero day vulnerabilities in a networking stack. Um, and uh, the name for this attack was chosen to be Ripple 20 because um, by attacking this network stack, uh, which was used in many, many different devices, um, the attack uh, basically rippled through, right? Um, so that's also a characteristic of Zephyr uh, being an Artos. Uh, it's a foundation component used in many types of devices. So if there are vulnerabilities in one, then basically there's, there's vulnerabilities in all, right? So how do we counter these? Um, well, there are three aspects I want to zoom into. Uh, so first of all, uh, more the technical aspects, uh, features and architecture in Zephyr uh, with respect to security. Uh, then the process and organization aspects, and finally testing and certification. Can you go to the next slide, Brad? So features and architecture. Uh, first of all, it starts with cryptographic functions. Um, that's the algorithms for encrypting, um, but also for signing, verifying, authentication, integrity protection. Um, 
Zephyr has a crypto and a driver API uh, for these crypto functions and also for random numbers, which are often used in security protocols. And uh, for these APIs, we have various implementations. So software implementations using the embed TLS and tiny crypt stacks, um, but on applicable uh, hardware platforms that have hardware acceleration, these drivers um, have been implemented uh, or these uh, drivers implement on the hardware accelerator. So giving better performance, lower power, and sometimes also more secure implementations. The next feature or architecture aspect is what I call platform security. Uh, so um, that deals with the trust in the software that you are running on the system. Uh, so it starts with secure boot. Within Zephyr, uh, we use the MCU boot project for this. And uh, instead of just referring to, well, please use MCU boot, uh, we really do um, integration of that. So the uh, Zephyr built environment, West, uh, includes the scripts for uh, signing uh, and potentially encrypting uh, of firmware images. Next is hardware and software stack checking. A lot of attacks exploit software um, bugs that, that leads to uh, stack overflows. Um, so on platforms where we have hardware support, these can be enabled. Um, there is also support in the tool chains using canaries. Um, that we support. So that's both hardware and software stack protections. Um, the types of devices Zephyr runs on often don't have a memory management unit and virtual memory. Um, that makes uh, address space layout randomization a bit hard, but at least for stacks, we do a bit uh, minimal uh, randomization of the stack layout. Then for processors supporting multiple privilege levels and having memory protection or memory management units, we support user space. Uh, so there's uh, kernel threats and there's user space threats. And this also includes access control. So for all threats, you can specify what kernel objects can be accessed. The uh, user space separation um, also includes uh, different memory domains and stack isolation. So user threats um, uh, cannot access the stacks of other, um, other threats, um, but also can be part of certain memory domains. So uh, memory variables can be uh, uh, blocked access to certain threats or Reserved access to others. Final platform security feature I want to mention is support for a secure mode. Uh, there are architectures uh, like ARM uh, implementing Trust Zone, ARC implementing Secure Shield that have an additional secure mode, uh, basically for creating a separate trusted execution environment. And uh, Zephyr has support for uh, for these uh, as well. Another aspect uh, is secure communication. Uh, Johan already mentioned uh, the uh, networking and BLE stacks. So security for that in the form of TLS, DTLS support is provided by Zephyr. Um, and similarly, the BLE uh, security features are covered. Then there's uh, work ongoing on additional security features. Uh, security coding guidelines I mentioned here. So we have these uh, guiding developers on how to apply a secure coding style and helping security reviews for that. Um, and recently also the TFM PSA uh, security solution has been uh, integrated. So that provides features for secure storage, device attestation, et cetera. So we have a good basis and the, especially on the security services we explained to uh, 
expand in coming time. Next slide talks about the process and organization. Uh, so on the organization, from the start, Sefer has had a security committee. Uh, so that uh, consists of a chair, a security architect, and various members. I think over time we have had some 20 people, maybe there's some 5 to 10 really active at the moment. Um, and together, basically, we manage the Zephyr security processes. Um, so that is uh, defining the security processes, uh, writing the uh, documents, uh, the secure coding guidelines, etc. Um, but it also includes the day-to-day -day, uh, handling of security incidents. So we handle uh, security vulnerabilities. And that brings me also to the next topics. Uh, CVE numbering authority. Um, so the Zephyr project um, is a so-called CNA uh, that stands for CVE, uh, Common Vulnerability Enumeration Numbering Authority. Um, and uh, for those of you that don't know CVE, it's like a large database uh, with known vulnerabilities and the information about it, uh, so in what software uh, do they occur? What versions? Uh, what versions have they been solved? And that basically helps users to uh, understand what are the risks, see if the vulnerabilities apply to their products, and uh, what version to use to to have a mitigation. Um, so uh, to become a CNA, you have to comply with certain uh, rules. Um, and we put everything in place on uh, documents and the different process requirements uh, to um, be a, uh, a CNA. And that means uh, we can uh, assign the CVE numbers for the database for vulnerabilities in the Zephyr stack. Um, part of the requirements there is that we have a defined vulnerability process. Um, so that basically uh, consists of a number of phases. Um, if vulnerabilities are uh, found either by separate developers or security researchers or other users, um, they can notify uh, the uh, Zephyr project, uh, for instance, by sending an email to the vulnerabilities as uh, zephyrproject.org. Um, that mail will be received uh, by the security committee. And then uh, we start an embargo period. So during the evaluation of the uh, vulnerability, and especially also during uh, the uh, fixing of the issues, um, only a limited set of people knows about it. We don't publicize it yet. Um, so we have an internal uh, JIRA uh, database. So we are not using the public GitHub issues uh, for tracking these. Um, and then we work with the maintainers to solve the issues. Uh, when that happens, uh, we disclose it uh, through the CVE numbers, but also uh, we list it in release notes for Zephyr. Next slide talks about uh, the vulnerability alert registry. Uh, so as I said, we have an embargo policy. Um, but of course, uh, besides Zephyr itself, downstream product device makers uh, also need to know what vulnerabilities to fix. Um, and moreover, they also need some time to fix them and provide software updates to their devices. Um, so for that, we started this uh, alert registry. You can sign up for it if you are a product vendor. There are some um, uh, requirements you have to, uh, to meet. You see them on the, the slide on the right. And um, when you are uh, admitted to this, uh, this list, then you get early warnings on the vulnerabilities during the embargo period. The Zephyr project uh, strives to solve the issues within 30 days. Um, the embargo period that we chose actually is 90 days. So that leaves 60 days for
for vendors to update uh, their uh, their products or take other countermeasures. Last process aspect on this slide is the uh, core infrastructure initiative uh, gold badge. Zephyr uh, was one of the first projects we achieving this uh, gold badge. Um, and it is basically about best practices for open source projects. Um, in infrastructure, the inversion management, project hosting, uh, release management, but also security practices. Um, and we are proud to be, have been one of the, uh, the first gold ones uh, there. Uh, other open source projects, I really recommend to, to have a look. It's, uh, it's a good list of uh, yeah, best practices to apply to your project. Next is uh, the third pillar, testing and certification. Um, so this is about avoiding security vulnerabilities in Zephyr. Uh, so first of all, uh, we have a rigid uh, code review practice for Zephyr, um, basically uh, using these secure coding guidelines. Um, it's not just the security committee that does this uh, code review. Um, basically, we use the GitHub reviews. Every PR needs to be signed off by at least two people. Um, so besides the security committee, uh, also the maintainers and other people are involved in these reviews. Next, uh, we leverage a lot of uh, tools and automation. Um, so uh, we run a sanity check a script with basic uh, tests on every pull request. Um, but we also weekly run uh, further code analysis, uh, static code analysis. We use the public uh, Coverity scan service uh, for that. Coverity is a synopsis tool for static code analysis for security and low quality issues. Um, but as a, for open source projects, there's a, a public uh, free version, Coverity Scan. So we do like weekly scans, and then based on the results, we uh, create uh, GitHub issues and uh, um, inform the uh, the code owners. Um, another tool uh, that Johan already mentioned is Defensix. Uh, so it is a fuzzing tool uh, that we use for the communication stacks. And ongoing work in progress currently is to do more fuzzing also on the software APIs. For instance, uh, fuzzing the system calls for user space support. Besides the project, uh, we are actually quite happy that um, also other people look at our sources. Uh, and if they find vulnerabilities, notify us. Uh, so a recent example is a report. I'll talk a bit about it on the next slide uh, from the NCC group. Um, but before zooming into that, uh, I want to talk a bit about certification. So one of the ambitions for Zephyr is to certify uh, according to some security standards, uh, the ARTLs as another proof uh, of the security of Zephyr. Um, this is work in progress. Uh, basically, one of the discussions we are having is what standard to certify against. Uh, should it be um, like FIPS 140-3? Um, should it be common criteria? Should it be one of the derivatives, CESIP, PSA? Um, basically, there are many, many standards to, to choose from. Um, what complicates things is that the certification often is done on a product uh, level, final product level, and not on the, uh, the software stack alone. Um, so we haven't really made up our mind yet um, how to implement this, uh, this certification. Um, what we find important, at the, what we find at least as important as the certification itself, um, is to make sure that the ARTLS is certifiable, so that we have the process and technical uh, features in place 
that meets these different certifications uh, schemes. Next slide, uh, Brett. Uh, thank you. So I said um, the MCC uh, security report. Uh, so this was a very uh, useful help from the MCC group that we got uh, this year. Uh, they did an analysis of the Zephyr Artos and MCU boots and uh, found 20 vulnerabilities, 25 in the Zephyr kernel and one in MCU boot. And um, well, obviously we have uh, fixed these, uh, some are really, uh, say, medium or low priority, um, uh, but definitely the critical and highs have been very quickly being uh, fixed and also backported to the LTS release. Um, meanwhile, the embargo is passed, so um, I think in, in May or so the public, uh, the report became public. And so you can find the, the details, you also see in the release notes, for instance, for the 114.2, what CVEs have been addressed. Um, and yeah, this was a great help for improving the, uh, the security of Zephyr. Um, besides that, we learned also uh, some things for our process. Uh, earlier, for instance, we had the embargo period for 60 days. We increased that to 90 days, um, including uh, time for downstream product developers to um, yeah, resolve issues, or prepare for, uh, for that. Um, so that brings me to the last bullet on this slide. Uh, Zephyr continues to improve. Uh, you actually see a quote from the NCC group uh, where uh, we got some compliments that uh, we really uh, were really fast in resolving the issues in uh, well, it said a reasonable time. Um, so um, security, unfortunately, is not like uh, a feature you develop once. It, requires continuous uh, effort and uh, that's what we continue for the next releases. Yep, that is the end. So next you'll hear about safety from Amber. Perfect. Hello, can you, can you all hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. And it looks like you just refreshed, Brett. Yes. Thank you so much. Hey, everybody. Let me turn on my camera. All right, you should be able to see me now. Hear me? Um, hello, everybody. My name is Amber Hibbard. I am an engineering manager on the Zephyr team at Intel, and I'm going to talk to you today about safety. Um, next slide, please, Brett. All right, so for those of you that may not be super familiar with safety, I'm just going to give a very high level introduction to how it's defined and what it means for us. So safety in software is really about minimizing or mitigating systematic faults in our code base. And this is faults, uh, systematic faults is human introduced faults, something that's introduced in the development process as opposed to random faults, which would be something in the hardware um, that could arise from random things like bit flips. Um, why are we doing safety? So by following certain safety processes, which we'll discuss later, uh, in the end, the hope is to provide a very robust and high integrity code base that has low systematic faults, and that can be used in safety critical applications, there are many examples of safety critical applications in a number of different market segments um, from automotive, industrial, medical. So you can think about um, you know, a software defined factory where you have robots uh, working closely with humans. You can think about um, autonomous vehicles, self-driving cars, um, and then tons of medical examples, et cetera. To meet safety, there are a number of standards that are out there. Um, I've highlighted here the IEC 61508 standard. Um, this is uh, 
effectively a parent standard for many of the other standards that are out there. Um, so the children's standards to ISC 61508 are more targeted towards these different markets. For example, ISO 26262, which some of you may be familiar with, is targeted towards the automotive segment. Um, but IAC 61508 is kind of the parent standard. And as I'll discuss, this is the standard that the Zephyr Project has decided to pursue initially. Next slide, please. Okay, so when we think about safety standards and going towards safety, a lot of it can be understood in the context of what's known as the V model, which is represented on the right-hand side of this slide. Um, so the V model can be thought about as a way to do software development. Um, and if you follow it to, certain, um, to a certain rigor and meet certain requirements, you are essentially meeting what is found in a lot of these safety standards. And so if we start from the left-hand side and kind of work our way down, you think about overall software development as starting from really well-defined requirements. So you would have some market requirements, product level requirements, and from there um, define what your software requirements are going to be from those market use cases. Uh, once you have defined requirements, then you work on your architecture, module design, um, how you're going to do the implementation, and then you do the coding. At every step during this process, there should be verification that's happening, and that's what's kind of represented on the right-hand side of this V of the V model. Um, so at every step from requirements to code, you verify that you are producing what you are intending to produce. And at the end, there should be some overall validation that you've done this. So for software that undergoes compliance safety development, often the V model is followed closely. Um, for Zephyr being an open source project, you know, this is not necessarily how it goes. And for open source software, because of this, there are additional challenges to meeting, um, to meeting safety requirements and to gaining a safety certification. So, I mean, for open source, you don't often start with like some defined set of requirements. You have um, a number of people from the community con contributing code. You don't always have um, a rigorous, you know, um, requirements for the traceability to be established when you're doing this. Um, so all of those things just lead to additional challenges here for open source. But in the end, what we need to do and what we're doing at the Zephyr Project is to basically provide the evidences that what we have in our code base can map back to this V model and the compliant development. Um, and that is what we're doing. So I'm going to next talk to you about where we're at with the project with our safety. So next slide. Thank you, Brett. Um, so we established the safety committee um, a couple years ago in 2019. We meet bi-weekly. <clears throat> we have really nice participation there. Um, there's typically around like 10 different people, core members who are attending. Um, we have made some initial decisions and in progress. So we decided on following the IEC 61508 standard, the one I mentioned on the first slide. And this is our initial target because it is the parent standard to a lot of the other market uh, specific standards. And once you have compliance to the standard, there is often a small delta to reaching the requirements and other standards. Um, Specifically in the IAC standard, we are following what's called Route 3S. This is what you follow if you have a pre-existing code base that you're working to certify, which is the case for Zephyr. Um, we have published a coding guideline um, and we are working on the CI enforcement for that. So to arrive at this coding guideline, the safety committee reviewed something like 300 plus different guidelines from the Mr. C standard, from JPL, um, from Cert C. And we, um, from that superset, agreed upon a set of around 100 plus coding guidelines um, that apply to Zephyr and that we feel will really increase the integrity of our code base. 
We have a number of other activities that are just starting or are in progress, and these are to meet traceability. So um, overall, we need to show that we have traceability from requirements to, to tests. Um, we need to meet 100% test coverage for all of our requirements that are in our safety scope. Um, there's a lot of work around tooling, uh, making sure that the tools that we use in our software development um, have been evaluated and in some cases qualified or, or validated to show that they themselves are not introducing systematic faults into the code. Um, and we are working on um, our engagement with a certification authority that will help direct us towards meeting safety standards and in the end, give us the safety certification against IEC 61508. Next slide, please. Okay, we have also decided on our initial certification focus. And so the idea here is that um, we will, for our first iteration of safety certification, pursue a limited scope, right? Because this is something that um, is new to the Zephyr project. And so we want to start with um, essentially the core OS, what we're called the core OS, and then in additional iterations add on top of this. And so you can see here um, our scope, our current scope, it's in blue. Um, so we have the kernel, some OS services, logging debug, um, low level APIs, some architecture interfaces, We've decided on x86 and ARM architectures to be part of our initial certification scope. Um, and then once we have this baseline certification done, we do intend to expand, add additional components and do Delta certs on top of it, um, including some other subsystems in the future. Next slide. Okay, this gives you kind of a high level idea of um, the activities, some of which I've already spoken to that we have on our roadmap. Um, the overall goal here is to buy LTS2, so Zephyr release 2.6 uh, next spring, to have most of the changes in the code that will need to be done before we create um, an auditable code base. So we plan to branch off of LTS2, create an audible code base, and then on top of that, do the remaining work that's required for certification. A lot of that will be at that point, hopefully documentation. Um, so just walking from left to right here. So I highlighted uh, with Zephyr release 2.4, we publish our coding guidelines. Um, we are now in the 2.5 timeframe and we, we are working on the tooling and processes that we need um, in general, but also specifically for traceability since the requirements to test are such a big part of, trace of, of safety requirements. Um, along with all of the tooling, we're um, doing the tools evaluation. So looking at every tool that we use in our software development, um, evaluating those tools for potential to introduce um, fault into the development. So that's tools classification. And then for those tools that are quote unquote risky, um, we'll do further work to qualify the tools, validate them to uh, minimize that fault that could be introduced. Um, we're working on the CI infrastructure for our coding guideline compliance. Um, and we're working on publishing our requirements, the functional requirements that would represent that architecture scope that was shown in the previous slide. Um, by LTS2, we want to have our coding guideline compliance achieved. We need to have 100% test coverage, um, et cetera. And then last slide. I actually, I want to keep this one for, for backup, Brett, um, if there's questions later on. This goes into more specific details of the safety collateral. Um, that we will be producing as a project as part of our safety certification and kind of the breakdown of whether those artifacts will be public or reserved for platinum members. Um, but I don't want to go into the line by line detail. And that's it from me.
Perfect. Uh, thank you again, Amber. Uh, up next, we have uh, Michael with Amp Micro. Michael? Hello, hello. Can you see me? Can you hear me? <laughs> we can hear you. Great. Awesome. Thanks very much. So let's get started. If I may ask for the first slide. All right. Uh, so uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, today I'm going to tell you about uh, uh, building tiny ML ecosystems with Zephyr, of course, uh, TensorFlow Lite Micro, as well as Renode. And especially, how do we build like a well tested ecosystem that enables us to do things that don't break? I have a lot of material, so I'll be asking Brett to advance the slides very quickly. So let's see how that works. So next slide, please. Uh, a little bit about where I'm coming from. So my company is founded you know, more than 10 years ago. And con like consistently, we build open source platforms. We build open source products. And especially important, I think, to say is that we're members of quite a few organizations that drive the open source ecosystem forward, including Zephyr Project, of course, but also like RiskLab International and, and related organizations. Next slide, please. Um, and we kind of do a bunch of things, starting with hardware, especially software. That's kind of our major focus. But we also do new platform development, you know, in FPGA uh, and in ASICs. However, if I may ask for the next slide, uh, tools is the most important uh, aspect of what we do. Tools is kind of uh, uh, permitting all the other things that we do because uh, the new methodologies, the uh, new ways of working that we enable with new tools uh, are kind of critical to being able to do many things effectively and in a software-driven way. And I'm going to show you today how we kind of uh, how we think about developing tiny machine learning applications and what kind of tools we recommend to do that. Next slide, please. Uh, TinyML, let me first define this. Uh, it's basically the trickling down of machine learning capabilities into smaller, lower power devices. And uh, those devices have a certain number of advantages. First of all, they just use less power than big devices. They're less complex. They don't have to communicate wirelessly into the cloud if they can do machine learning on board. They don't need to ask you know, a server for data or like communicate back. They can do stuff autonomously. This also increases responsiveness of those machine learning algorithms, as well as the privacy, because, of course, you don't need to transmit sensitive data out, outside. Uh, this also enables new machine learning use cases, because you can do you know, very uh, nicely low latency uh, focused gesture recognition. You can do uh, sound recognition that's very close to the user and acts immediately. You can detect anomalies when they happen, where they happen. So a lot of great opportunities there. If I may ask the next slide. Uh, there's also a lot of challenges, though. And of course, the, the, the constraints in the devices themselves uh, are a problem, too. You have little power. You have low performance. You have quite little memory. Uh, and especially in the testing area, you know, these are kind of different kinds of devices. These are uh, constrained, varied devices that come with their own tool chains, with their own libraries. Um, they're sometimes hard to source. It's hard to kind of deploy them at scale. Uh, they might involve complex configurations of many unit systems that are connected over various protocols. So testing all of this manually uh, is very hard. People actually don't test a lot, like we've seen among all, many of our clients. Uh, they test much less than they would in, in a regular software development context. Zephyr, of course, tries to fix that you know, with board farms and with uh, a good continuous integration testing infrastructure. But uh, it's hard to, to copy that kind of infrastructure if you're a small company just trying to build a product. Um, so, so there's a problem with you know, reliability. There's a problem of determinism. You can even build perhaps a test scenario. But you won't be necessarily able to guarantee repeatedly that you're going to get the same result with the same input. Uh, so, so in practice, your continuous integration setup will be, well, less than perfect. So yeah, we need to solve that challenge. Next slide. Yeah. Uh, and uh, now about TensorFlow Lite Micro itself. Uh, this is the part of the TensorFlow Lite uh, TensorFlow uh, machine learning framework. Uh, it's it's part of the light branch of that framework, and the the the, the light version is oriented at mobile phones. So if you go 
to the Tesla Lite page, you'll see a mobile phone there, as you can see on the on the right, the hero image is a mobile phone. Uh, but of course, like over time, uh, tiny devices, mic controllers became so powerful that you can actually, and then people at Google thought, okay, let's try to run machine learning on them. Uh, and so uh, if you want to see where Tesla Lite Micro resides, uh, it, it can be found in the following link of GitHub. And what it targets is kind of sub milliwatt devices, uh, like in general. Of course, in practice, those devices may be bigger than that, but the, the end goal is to be really, really small and, and focus on stuff that can go on on battery for, for, for years, right? And Or perhaps even without battery if it's kind of powered by solar energy and so on. And uh, what's important to understand with Tensorflow Lite Micro is that it's, you know, it's, it's agnostic to architectures. It works with different operating systems, so it's not necessarily ARM focused, or it's not just Zephyr focused. It's it's just a framework for machine learning. You can kind of snap on too many things. Um, and the collaboration with with Google uh, has lasted a while now. Uh, so we started working with them in 2018. We've been doing a bunch of work in like open source ASICs, FPGA, software machine learning. Uh, but specifically, this work also kind of started in a sense in 2018 when we enabled running Tesla lights uh, on Risk Five, uh, That was a proof of concept we did in 2018 for the Risk Five Summit. And uh, we presented it together at a workshop. And from there, we kind of went on to continue collaborating. Uh, we did an initial integration with Zephyr and did some co-marketing with Zephyr and Risk Five about that. Uh, and then we continued on that path and we integrated you know, that work with simulation in Renode which resulted to uh, in this in this blog note we did with uh, TensorFlow Lite team uh, on the blog, and that in turn turned into a collaboration uh, uh, that's currently like a big collaboration where uh, that team has adopted Renode for their testing, uh, for showcasing TF Lite Micro and so on, which I'll be talking about today. Uh, and the demo that I'll be kind of walking you through a little bit uh, it was created in 2019. Uh, well, actually, late 2019, where we put a software Skype CPU in a low-cost FPGA board, the Digilent RTA7. And we simulated the entire thing in Renode, of course, but I'm going to get to that. Uh, the important thing to, to note is that that was a prototype of a Zephyr integration, so Zephyr plus TF Lite Micro working together. And we also get, got it to be an end-to-end -end flow where you could, of course, deploy it on real hardware. That's like what you, everyone wants to do eventually. But you could also deploy it you know, in CI in the cloud or run it on your computer completely without hardware. And if you're interested to kind of read more about where that led to, there was a blog note published middle of 2020 about, well, running this entire thing in, in simulation uh, and in CI. Okay, so I've been telling you about Renode, but I haven't told you what Renode is. So perhaps we'll start with, yeah, it's it's a framework. It's a tool for developing IoT stuff. Uh, it's a simulator, of course, in the most basic context, but uh, it's so much more than that. We call it a framework because uh, it's actually a development framework. Um, and people have used it for various things. We initially created Renode for the development of like complex software for embedded systems for IoT. Uh, you can simulate you know, your hardware and then run your software on this virtual board or set of boards in Renode. But it turned out that people actually want to use Renode for various things like architectural research, like pre-silicon prototyping and hardware software code development. So in fact, the flexibility of the framework has enabled uh, different kinds of use cases. Uh, it's been in development since 2010, so it's a pretty kind of uh, a framework with a long history. We open sourced it in 2015, and like to give you a third round number in 2020, which is today, uh, admittedly not the best year in history. Uh, Renode has been pretty successful and has been gaining immense traction. I'm going to show you a little bit of that in a second. Uh, what we think is good about Renode is uh, basically a few concepts that it uh, uh, follows. First up, it's because uh, Renode has those plug and play building blocks that you can kind of use to assemble your platforms. You don't need to like write a lot of code. You typically just go and write configuration files, and that's it. Your platform is working. Secondly, we have like the 
battery included uh, batteries included approach where we have a lot of demos and binaries you can just play around with just after downloading Renote. You don't need to kind of compile your own. I mean, you should eventually, but <laughs> if you just want to get started, there's a bunch of demos that uh, exist and you can uh, we host them on our servers. You can just download them and, and play around. Uh, it's also very flexible. And uh, I think what's important to note is the, the fact that it's software agnostic. So it's like, I'm talking about it in the Zephyr context. Of course, it doesn't need to run Zephyr. It can run various kinds of software. But us being strong supporters, uh, supporters of Zephyr, of course, we're kind of very happy when people run Zephyr on it. And uh, the last thing to be said here is that it's it's very, very CI-oriented, even though, of course, I'll be talking around some interactive use cases in a second. Uh, actually, a lot of our infrastructure, a lot of our features is is kind of related to continuous integration. We have uh, a good support for the robot framework for writing tests. We have integration of Jenkins, GitLab CI, GitHub Actions, and so on. And uh, one other thing, perhaps, that needs noting is uh, we enable people to test protocols uh, and stacks. Like connectivity is also kind of part of what Renode enables you to test. And people have used it to test stuff like OPC UA. We've actually developed TSN and Zephyr, so we, we used it to test TSN, six low on thread, and so on and so on. Uh, oh, sorry, one, one important thing for uh, 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 understanding Renode is to, to look at this picture and, and realize that even though simulators, if you think about simulators, they typically uh, uh, make you think in this uh, context of a system on chip. On the, on, so on the left side, you can see a system on chip, and we can simulate that, of course. Uh, that's pretty normal. So we can simulate a CPU. We can simulate a bunch of IOs around the CPU. But then you can go and simulate an actual board, right? A full system with sensors, with buttons, even screens, right? We, we can do frame buffers and stuff like that. And, and you can go even further. In Reno, you can simulate an entire system with like a network, with uh, uh, you know, a gateway connected to multiple sensors. And, and that gives you, you know, an ability to test your system end to end, like the entire use case with all the software that's running in it. And especially important is the, the notion of like simulating peripherals and sensors. So you know, we don't just focus on SOCs, but but kind of all the I/O and sensors like thermometers and humidity meters, accelerometers, microphones. So especially in the machine learning context, you can imagine that we can kind of test the entire use case where we see what's going to happen if you put some data through the sensors into the machine learning uh, uh, framework like like uh, TensorFlow Lite Micro, and what kind of output are we going to get, and how is this output going to affect the entire system? Because you can imagine that this device then goes and um, like steers another device to do something in response to to a positive outcome of a machine learning algorithm, and we can do this end to end testing of entire systems. We support a number of vendors and platforms. Here's here's a bunch. Uh, of course, you know uh, our friends at uh, Nordic, uh, NXP, Microchip, ST. You know all the all the familiar faces in the Cortex M world. Uh, I'm going to tell you a few words about Quick Logic uh, later on, and of course the excellent Risk V architecture, as well as Open Power, both open source ISAs. Uh, so plenty of stuff. Uh, of course, our major focus is microcontrollers, but we also have pretty beefy platforms like Microchips, Polar Fire SOC, which is a five-core, you know, Risk Five FPGA SOC that runs Linux. So quite a beast, um, and we can simulate that too. Uh, if you want to take a look at boards, there's a supported board section in our documentation. Here's some of them. Here's like I think it's ten on this slide, and on the next slide, we can see ten more. And that's not even all of them, but uh, yeah, you might recognize some of those and, and kind of get excited and hopefully go and download Renode and run a virtual copy of that board. OK, so how's it work? Uh, so if you want to see a repository, here's the repository uh, on GitHub. And I'll walk you through some of the files in that repository, which are meaningful for, for Renode. Uh, the first one is um, an I square C controller in C sharp. Like basically, Renode is written in C sharp. It's the .NET platform, so you can actually write peripherals in Python if you want. We're actually experimenting with writing peripherals in Rust, but the majority of our IOs is actually C sharp. Uh, and this is like an interesting case because here at the point in time when we did this, we didn't have this I square C controller inside of Renode. So what we did, we kind of implemented that externally. 
and Renode can load peripherals on the fly. You don't have to recompile the framework. You can just kind of load the file, and you're getting a new type of peripheral model inside the framework. If you go to the next slide, uh, that's data files. So obviously, as I mentioned, we can do an end-to-end -end flow where we input data into Renode and see what happens. So, so like that's the cool thing. We have determinism, right? We can fully deterministically run stuff, and the result will always be the same. So being able to feed like the same data over and over again and see what happens is crucial for continuous integration. On the next slide, uh, we see the REPL file. So if you go to the next slide, uh, that's our platform description format, so Renode platform file. Uh, REPL is a human readable modular extendable format. And as I mentioned before, essentially, if you write a REPL file, it's just a script, right? It's, it's like a device tree file. So you write this, and you can essentially make it simulate a new Renode platform without writing a single line of code. Uh, if we go to the next slide, we'll see what this REPL file looks like. Uh, here's a UART, a, a CPU, and an interrupt controller for a RISC-V system. And uh, basically, that's it, right? <laughs> uh, the next slide is a RISC file, which is a script file. So you, any command that you can input to the Renode uh, uh, CLI, you can also put in a script. So you know, it's just a scripty language. And the last file there, oh, what happened here? Sorry. Uh, let's skip two slides then. <laughs> Uh, that's actually the demo that if you run this repository, if you go download this repository and uh, uh, try to run it as, as instructed, you're going to see this kind of output. So starting from the beginning, you know, you go to Renode, you run Renode, you run the script. A console appears with a nice Renode logo and a UART output. You start the demo, and then you see uh, those files are being fed into Renode, and they're being recognized as gestures. This is a ring gesture, and the other is an, uh, a slope gesture. Uh, and this is really TensorFlow Lite recognizing those gestures from the data that we're inputting. That's the end of the demo, basically. It's going to slope twice. If we may advance, advance the next slide, please. OK, so a little bit about testing and metrics, now getting to this testing part. Um, effectively, Renode uh, is meant to be used in the company environment. So even though like on a local PC, you can do a lot of cool things with Renode in, in the interactive use case, it's meant to work in a broader context of a company. And you can get some help from colleagues in that context. You can kind of have a server that runs continuous integration and a bunch of deterministic tests. Um, and we envision Renode to be this kind of tool that like people have said it's, it's the docker of embedded. I think it's Pete Warden that actually said that. So uh, I, I love this comparison because in a sense, of course, it's in a sense, it's kind of, not exact, right? But uh, in another sense, it's exactly what we want it to be, a platform in which you can build and test embedded systems. If we go to the next slide. Uh, we can see how an example CI could look like. Uh, if you go to this repository, it has a built-in Travis CI. Of course, uh, we can work with GitLab CI, Jenkins, GitHub Actions. We have examples for all these things. But uh, this is kind of uh, the easiest to see Renal in action. Uh, we also have stuff that gives us abilities to analyze metrics of performance and execution. Uh, this is very good for CI because we don't all we don't only see whether things broke or not. We can also see whether things are getting better or worse and uh, how they're you know working over time. We can generate metrics from how many instructions are being executed, memory, how it's being accessed, and so on and so on. And we have virtual time, so we can kind of trace this uh, specifically deterministically because in real time, of course. It depends on your host machine, how fast it simulates things. But in virtual time domain, it's all deterministic. And to see this in action, we, we see uh, that's a use case that we did where we kind of uh, analyzed the quantization method, optimization method, method, where we simplified a CNN network. And that was done completely without instrumentation of code, right? This is data extracted entirely from simulation. So we can experiment you know, with various things without touching the code. We can, for example, give the code more memory to operate in and see what happens. So it's, it's pretty nice for these kind of things. Uh, if you want to see more of like Reno being used in action for testing, we have this testing.reno.io uh, framework where we just run a bunch of different uh, firmwares and, and systems through Reno uh, continuously every week. Uh, we have, for example, Zephyr's TSN subsystem being tested there, but also like other things, ContiQS, you know, LightX, and MicroPython, and so on. 
And in that system, you can get like nice logs. Uh, this is actually a, something that we can set up for our customers to uh, um, where you can see all the builds. And then if we go to the next slide, you can see like build logs and artifacts and so on. So, so this is kind of an entire CI system that's built from open source components. And uh, uh, we run it uh, as a CI dashboard, so to say, for various firmwares. On the next slide, you, yeah, let's let's see how you can kind of what we're gonna do moving forward and how you can try Reno yourself. Uh, so currently, we're focused on developing this Arduino Nano 33 BLE Sense platform that has an Nordic NRF 52840 on it. It's a Corex M4F, uh, and that's connected to an Arduino Mini camera, it's an SBA camera, which enables, of course, vision-focused goals. We can do person detection, for example. We'll be able to do like uh, voice detection using the, the built-in microphone. It's a really cool board because it features a lot of sensors. You can see that on the right, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, this this kind of will be supporting that platform pretty well. That's a like primary platform for the TensorFlow Lite guys. It's also being used at Harvard for their courses. Um, of course, this is not going to be our only focus. We'll also be adding support for more platforms, including a very interesting one with Risk Five on board. And we'll also be revamping the entire TensorFlow Lite micro CI infrastructure to use Renode. Uh, and specifically, there will be a CI for Zephyr integration uh, that's also in the scope of that project. So, so it's kind of lots of incredible things going to be happening in the coming months. And one thing that I'm going to highlight, too, is Google Colab, which is uh, uh, going to enable us some kind of you know demos where you can record your voice or record your image, you as a person, and then we'll be able to run that through TensorFlow Lite Micro and see what the results are. If we go to the next slide, there's more about Colab here. I'm not going to read it all, but it's like it's a fantastic tool for presentation and demonstration. It effectively, it allows you to run code in the cloud. You can run Reno in the cloud, so you can run embedded devices in the cloud. If we go to the next slide, we'll see the results of such a Colab. Um, you know, these are graphs coming from the uh, performance analysis framework. And this is executed completely in the cloud. It's not connected to any kind of system. I mean, this is a system running somewhere in Google infrastructure. It's a computer that Google Cola provides for you, but you don't have to install anything. This is just like something you can run in five minutes. You take that link from the previous slide, and you can get running very, very quickly. Uh, we're also using Renote for education now. We have a course at the Poznan University of Technology in collaboration with ST. Uh, so we're going to make a board available to students virtually because the pandemic situation has closed up labs in at any university. Uh, and the course is going to be using a lot of cool technologies, including Reno, but also like Zephyr, TensorFlow Lite, Sphinx, that Zephyr also uses for documentation. So the entire technology stack will be provided by Edmicro. And there's interest from Harvard to, to also kind of do similar things. If you go to the next slide, this is almost the end now. Uh, just kind of highlighting that uh, these problems are universal and kind of these kind of ideas, how do we empower ecosystems? How do we build out a community uh, are shared with, of course, Google. I've been talking about them quite a lot, but then also ARM and Microchip and QuickLogic. Uh, ARM actually is also working using Renode and TF Lite Micro. Uh, Microchip has been a great partner working with us on the RISC-V Polar Fire SOC, and they built an entire pre-silicon development platform uh, based on Renode. And quick logic, which I'll highlight on the next slide. Uh, these guys, uh, I hope I got that slide. <laughs> yeah, quick logic has been an incredible partner. We've built, you know, an entire ecosystem of open source with them. This is an open source board that we built for them. Uh, Renode, of course, simulates this. It's a Cortex M M4 as well. Uh, Zephyr Artos that we ported to this board, and most importantly, there's the first ever FPGA vendor to do open source tooling for FPGA fabrics. So this tool, this has an FPGA on it, and you can program this FPGA entirely with open source tools that these guys sponsored and that they support. And what's even more exciting is that there's some upcoming products from them that will feature some even cooler stuff, You know, bigger FPGAs, bigger cores, all of it supported in Zephyr, in Renode, and so on. And it's a joint project with Google, so pretty exciting stuff. And I'm going to talk about more about this. I'll be able to reveal more as well uh, at the Risk Five Summit, uh, where I'll be hosting a keynote discussion panel with Google Zephyr Project and Quick Logic, entitled "Building an Open Edge Machine Learning Ecosystem for Risk Five Zephyr, TensorFlow Lite, Micro, and Renode." I know it's a long title, but you know. 
Okay, that's that's all I had, I think. Uh, yeah, if you want to get started, uh, just go ahead, download Renode. We have packages for various operating systems, including various Linux distros, Mac OS, and Windows. So I encourage you to just kind of get going. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Michael. Thanks for all our speakers. We'll start our Q&A session now. Um, all the speakers, if you please uh, unmute yourself and turn on your camera. And we'd love to get um, live discussions going. Thanks for uh, typing in questions throughout the session. So we'll, uh, um, some of them get, uh, are already get, got answered. We have a couple of them. I'll start with that and mean, in the meantime, Please uh, fire away with your questions, and we'd love to, to get some live discussions going here. So the first one I have, Michael, is for you about Renode. Do you plan to integrate DTS into Renode? Meaning yes, the board's DTS would be enough to describe the board you would like to simulate. That's, that's a question we get a lot, right? So effectively, Go ahead, Michael. DTS. DTS is very similar to uh, the format that we have. Uh, it's you know kind of typical DTS descriptions lack a bunch of detail that we might need. Uh, but on the other hand, they do contain quite a lot of information. So uh, there is no, no fixed plan, but like that has been a constant discussion uh, around it. Uh, so yeah, so many people like ask about it that we'll definitely have to revisit that and, and get do some thinking. A similar question has been raised with you know SVD files. Uh, which are like description files for for boards that some vendors provide for CPUs mostly and SOCs, uh, and with with that uh, we actually do support SVD for example where you can load an SVD file and uh, get you know register values, uh, reset values, and so on. Uh, but yeah, we'll be working more also kind of in the relationship with Google. We're thinking how to make a more like industry standard ways to describe hardware to enable simulation more easily and so on. So no, no fixed plan, but like, yes, constantly on our mind. Thanks, Michael. Brett, we can stop presenting. So all the speakers will be uh, on live here. So we can uh, uh, stop yes. presenting the slides. Just, yep. uh, you. Thanks for your help. Great. Um, so the next one I have from Barak. Do you have plans to extend support for FPGA integrated SOC as Altera ARIA or Xilinx MPSOC? I'm not aware of any plans. I do believe there is. Sorry, if I may, uh, there, there's, there is Cortex R5 support for the Ultrascale Plus. So if you're not running, I mean, if you wanted to run it on the big cores, the Cortex A53, then no, you can't do it yet. Although I, I don't see why you shouldn't be able to at some point. Uh, I'm sure that will happen, but it's not there yet. But with the Cortex R5 cores, which are included in the Ultrascale Plus, uh, indeed, Zephyr already works there, and Micro has done some work also. In that area, but no, I haven't seen anything on the Intel area stuff. Maureen, do you have anything to add to that? No. All right, great. Um, we have another question from Henrik. Are there any examples using TensorFlow Lite with Zephyr without using Renode? Uh, so I guess I'll answer that. Well, actually, if you think Michael, about it, do you Renode... want? Uh, do you have any? It seems I have a slight delay. That's why I keep starting to speak before we finish. Um, so effectively, yeah, I think so. Yes, absolutely yes. In the sense that Renode is just a target that you run against instead of a board. So in fact, uh, if you think about it, any example that we make for Renode, right, you should be able to take and run it on the board as well. So even if you go to that repository, yes, of course, we focus on the Renode way of running things because it's just easier for anyone to run it. But if you grab a physical board and if you grab a sensor, there is also instructions how to upload the same exact binary that we run in simulation onto the board, right? And that doesn't like go through Renode in any way because Renode is just like simulating your hardware, 
but it's not in any way influencing the way you do your software. The software you develop exactly the same way you'd normally develop it for your thing. So the, the, the software development part is completely just Zephyr plus TF Lite, and then you get a binary. And then you can choose whether you run this binary on uh, uh, Renode or whether you run this binary on hardware. Thanks, Michael. We'll keep the questions coming. Uh, next one is from Andreas. Are there any plans to add API for crypto accelerators for asymmetric crypto? Rude, I'll have you take this one. You're on mute if you're talking. Thanks. Uh, yeah, a good point because the, the current abstractions that we have are uh, basically started from the uh, requirements for BLE. Um, and uh, we don't have uh, Zephyr specific API or abstraction for asymmetric crypto currently. Um, what we use for, for asymmetric is the, the TLS uh, solution. Uh, so asymmetric is available. Um, we we might uh, yeah pick another API uh, standardize on that. Uh, there's there's a few candidates. Uh, we could do some PKCS eleven. Uh, we could do the uh, uh, embed crypto, uh, but no firm decision on that yet. So for now, it's it's the embed TLS APIs. Thank you. The next one I have is on uh, Zephyr. How tiny can Zephyr be, code plus data? I want to compare to with a ThreadX port to an M class core with just the bare minimum to support few threads and synchronization elements. I'll take that one. Maureen, yeah. can you take this one? Um, I mean, we get this question a lot. It's it's it can be a challenge to answer because the the, the minimal footprint or minimal set of features kind of depends on who's asking the question. Um, but that being said, uh, we I, I would encourage you to take a look. There's an entry sample application that we use to um, try to build from a Zephyr perspective the the, the smallest. Uh, subset of features possible and that that will get you down into the the single digits of flash and ram and that's going to be somewhat architectural dependent but that, that ballpark i unfortunately i don't have numbers for threadx so i can't give you a comparison there but in general you know the footprints for comparable features do tend to be somewhat comparable so you're not going to see huge differences Great, thanks, Maureen. Well, thanks for the ongoing questions. So keep them, uh, keep them coming. If there are follow-up questions, we'd love to have a, a discussion going uh, as well. From the speaker's point of view, if there anything that you want to, to highlight while uh, the question's coming in here, the floor is yours. All right, here we are, Florent. <clears throat> As said, safety is also related to handling random fault from the hardware. There, there is or there will be some features to help on that point. Amber, uh, do you want to take this one? Yeah, of course. Yeah, good question. Um, there are no plans for that yet. And that's not to say that once we get further into like, doing our safety analysis, that we might add some features to mitigate uh, hardware fault, but that's unlikely to be in our initial certification. That would likely come in uh, uh, future, future iterations. I could add there uh, that uh, there was a pull request, but th I think that relates a little bit to that for uh, non maskable interrupts. So there is a framework coming for that. I think typically this kind of memory errors uh, that are generated, they would come through uh, as uh, non maskable interrupts. So uh, it's, uh, 29585 is the pull request uh, that was submitted uh, a couple of days ago. 
Oh, thank you, Johan. Um, yeah, so I guess the question is whether that falls into the uh, initial certification scope, like the code base that we've intended on already. Um, so yeah, I'll yeah. have to look into that. All right. Thanks, Johan. Thanks, Amber. I have another question from Hernan. Are there some regular ongoing meetings when the, uh, when team meets so we can participate? I know we have various meetings. Do, do we want to start from TSC or other uh, aspects, how these meetings are accessible to the contributors, Maureen? Yeah, I'll take that. Um, there are plenty of meetings depending on your area of interest. Um, to start off with, there is a wiki, or a, a wiki page that we post all of our meetings, uh, including uh, links and dial-in numbers and things like that. And I'll, I'll pull that up in a moment and, and post it here. Um, but a couple of, of things to highlight. So the, the Technical Steering Committee meets weekly on Wednesdays. There is a weekly API meeting where we discuss proposals for, for changing, adding new APIs, things like that. There is a, um, a developer review meeting. That's another good one for, for new people into, that are interested in the community. This is a venue for people to kind of get on the phone and actually discuss open issues that, that it's sometimes it, you know, it's difficult to, to go back and forth on GitHub too many times. So it, that's, that's kind of the purpose of that dev review meeting. But there are a number of other meetings around security, safety, uh, you know, it all just depends on your area of interest. So I'll pull up that link in a moment here and uh, get you on your way. Thanks, Maureen. And there's also a wealth of um, documentations and get, getting started information available on the Zephyr site. So we welcome you to check those out. Um, what's the best way to find maintainer of a subsystem? Just write a ticket on the GitHub or use another channel? How do we want to, um, how do you approach this? So we have a maintainer file. It's called maintainers.yaml at the top level of the tree. And that'll point you to who's responsible for each subsystem. Thanks, Maureen. Um, how do you rate the current C++ STL support for Zephyr? OS-related abstractions like STD thread, STD lock. Any of my panelists taking this one? There have been um, a, a number of members of the community that are interested in C++ support. I, I, I can't say offhand what the state of STL um, and those specific examples are, but I, I'd encourage you to reach out to on the Slack channel um, to ask questions. Thanks, Maureen. My daughter started playing piano, so you might hear that a little bit. Um, Zephyr is licensed under Apache Turaro and the Linux GPL v2, only which are incompatible according to the F um, FSF. Have you discussed addressing this example by adding an exception for linking with GPL v2 code? Um, I'm not sure if any of us uh, have this or we can uh, take this question and follow up. Alvin, thanks for the question. We'll, uh, we'll follow up on this, uh, on this one. I'm taking a note here. Well, I would love to get a discussion going. So please keep your questions coming if you have uh, 
uh, follow up questions for any of our panelists. Well, still regarding safety, is there some plan to help qualifications of the tool chain, tool chain bug analysis and use it, uh, usage constraints? Amber, Good I'll have you question. take this one. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we do have plans to qualify uh, any tools that um, are classified as TI2 or 3, and definitely the tool chain are going to be one of those. Um, you know, we are in the initial stages of, um, you know, determining all the tools that are in our scope and doing the classification. So details about how we will do the fall for the tool chain uh, are still to be determined. Comparing to IAR. Thanks for the question, Florin. Oh, Thanks, Amber. Nope. Keep going. All right, um, Guy, is there a particular IDE you would recommend for Zephyr application development and debugging uh, comparing to IAR? So there, Maureen, Michael, if yeah, any of you guys can chime in. There are, there are a couple of options on that front. Um, so to start, uh, if, if you're using, <coughs> excuse me, um, if you're interested in Eclipse type of environment, um, you have two options there. There is an exporter, so you can export your CMake into a, a, an Eclipse project, but then you can then import on the Eclipse side of things. So that will allow you to use uh, Zephyr in, you, you know, a vanilla Eclipse or a vendor Eclipse like MC Expresso. Um, so that's one side. Now I'm, I'm aware that there are some people that are also using it in Visual Studio Code. Um, I haven't tried that myself, but I've heard that there's been some good success on that. I think Nordic did a, a good tutorial recently on, on how to use Zephyr in Visual Studio Code. There's also support for uh, Segar Embedded Studio, specifically on Nordic platforms. Um, oh, and I forgot, going back to the Eclipse uh, just for a moment, there's also an Eclipse plugin um, that, that Intel has, has shared with the community as well. So that's a, another Eclipse-based option that you can use. Johan, are there any that I've forgotten or, or Michael? In the in the VS Code world, right? There's Platform IO. It's essentially a plugin oh, right. to a bunch of. Uh, so Platform IO is is kind of both uh, like a manager of firmware, so you can run Zephyr and other things from within Platform IO. But in in another sense, it's an IDE that uh, uh, enables you to uh, debug stuff bo both on boards, but actually also in Renode. We have an in integration, so you can kind of run simulation through Platform IO. It's a pretty neat little uh, tool. Thanks, Maureen. Thanks, Johan. Any other uh, tools, firmwares that uh, uh, that you guys has, uh, found helpful that you want to call it out here for the the community? All right, I have a question from Stefan. Are there awareness tools getting insights on context switches, IRQ, et cetera? So awareness uh, tools in the ecosystem. Like OS aware tools, I guess that's probably uh, in terms of like tracing and debugging and so on. Uh, I'm not, not aware of any built in ones, but. Yeah, there is a tracing uh, support, tracing subsystem. Um, it generates uh, common trace formats. Um, so there are various tools that can be used with that. I'm not the experts in this area, but uh, for sure there's, there's support. And the standard tool chain, so GDB, um, also has threat awareness. So I've also heard of people using uh, Sega Embedded Studio for, for, for that as well. Yeah, let me add to that as well. So OpenOCD and PyOCD, both uh, their GDB servers, both have support for uh, Zephyr thread awareness. And so you can plug that into if you're using a GDB client, uh, it can it, uh, parse through the different threads. Um, there's another one I was going to mention that I've forgotten now that I started talking. <laughs> um, 
I've lost it. <laughs> Well, if it comes back to you, we're here. <laughs> but these are all great questions, uh, Florent, Stefan, Andreas. Thank you for uh, actively participating uh, here. And please keep the questions coming, but we're uh, always available on Slack, on Twitter, LinkedIn, so easy to reach out. And uh, as Maureen mentioned, uh, um, there are meetings also uh, you can participate in. And there's also a question from Efrain. Are there any plans to use more inclusive language similar to what GitHub is doing? So I know we have a lot of effort going on on this uh, space. Uh, Maureen, if you want to uh, chime in or. I actually was gonna ask Amber since she's leading the effort on that front. Okay. Sure, yeah. Thanks, Maureen. Um, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, there is absolutely a bunch of activity happening right now on the Zephyr project. Um, we are, we've had a few discussions in the TSC and kind of one-off meetings of the TSC to figure out how our overall plan for how we will transition to more inclusive language. Um, you know, and this takes many forms, right? From changing from uh, Zephyr master Git to um, something more inclusive, Zephyr main, for example, um, also changing from the use of blacklist whitelist to um, an alternative blacklist allow list, um, changing things like the name of sanity check. So we find this um, throughout Zephyr, you know, both in the branch and among the subsystems. Um, and so kind of high level, um, our timeline for this is to, for Zephyr, um, main branch to make the transition um, in parallel with GitHub because they are, you know, once they make the transition, then that will give us a lot of, um, it'll make our transition easier. And that's looking like it's around the end of the year, maybe beginning of next year. So that should happen either in Zephyr um, 2.5 or 2.6 release. Um, and then for our subsystems, you know, it some of them like um, you know I2C, SPY, Bluetooth, they are tied to a corresponding spec or standard, and we've decided that we will not change um, until the corresponding spec or standard um, to avoid a number of complications that may arise. And so that's going to trickle in slower over um, the end of 2020 and 2021. But we plan to publish kind of an overall summary page of our plans and the timeline for all of those updates. Um, so that's coming soon on Zephyr documentation. Anything else that I missed, Maureen, on that? I don't think so. Sanity check, did you mention that? Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Amber. Thanks for leading that effort. And I have a question from Patrick. Uh, how will the safety Zephyr be made available? And it, is there a specific cadence plan for this safety Zephyr configuration similar to the LTS cadence? Great question, Patrick. Um, yeah, so I mean, the plan is, you know, there's the different aspects of safety, right? There's going to be the auditable code base, which we're calling it. So the the code base that has you know, met all of the safety requirements needed, but then there's also all of the corresponding um, artifacts and documentation. And so you know, the code base will be publicly available, but for the artifacts that are submitted for certification, those will be uh, primarily reserved for platinum members of the Zephyr project. Um, and then the question disappeared, but I think the second part about cadence, that's a little TBD. So our initial goal, like I said, is to align with LTS2. Um, our LTS releases are on a two-year cadence. And, you know, likely if there's a recert, um, it might make sense to align with those, right? Like an LTS release would be the best for safety, having that longer-term support. But we haven't really finalized plans past um, this first release for LTS2. Thanks, Amber. I think we have time for one or a couple more questions.
well going ones. Maybe someone is typing, but uh, I will wrap it up uh, here. Thanks for your active participation. We appreciate all the, the questions and enthusiasm uh, to the project. And uh, as we repeatedly mentioned throughout the talk, Zephyr is open source. So we welcome you to join us and uh, join the community uh, to, to contribute. And I think I have one question. So let's, oh, a couple more coming in here. Is there as the recommended first choice uh, see an open stack for Zephyr. I'll take that. There's an integration of the can open node uh, uh, stack that's been integrated as a uh, a West module. I think I actually saw the uh, Bricks here, who's who's on the call. He did that work. So um, yeah, so yeah, that's that's already built in and integrated with with Zephyr today. I think it's been in for two or so releases already. So it's already there. Thanks. Uh, we'll make this as the last question. There are plans to add, uh, plans to add MMU support to Zephyr, at least for several architectures. Is it also an attempt to compete with embedded Linux? Are there plans to propose Zephyr usage for something high performance? So we already have uh, some level of MMU support. Uh, this is, by the way, an area that I'm not uh, that experienced in, but uh, there is uh, limited support for that already in Zephyr. Um, as far as competing with Linux, I don't think that's the uh, intention. Mm -hmm. I, I know there are some uh, use cases where uh, people might want to get uh, real-time uh, capabilities on one core uh, and rather than running the uh, real-time patch for, for Linux to run Zephyr there or something like that, that that could be a use case where you want to run it on a very high performance course. But uh, that, that's uh, all I can think of uh, as far as the answer to this question is concerned. Please, if somebody else has uh, anything yeah, else to add. Sure. Let, me, let me continue on that. Yeah. Um, so the MMU support uh, basically started uh, as an implementation of the uh, memory domains and the memory protections that, that we have with uh, processors that have a, a memory protection unit, MPU. Um, so uh, the current support basically um, yeah, gives similar uh, protections. Huh? So uh, read, write, execute protections for certain memory regions. Uh, it doesn't provide virtual memory. Uh, or things like demand paging, et cetera. Um, there, there are uh, some activities ongoing on to, to use MMU hardware uh, for more purposes. So some limited virtual memory maybe, um, but definitely it's, it's not the, the goal to, to start competing with Linux. Um, these solutions serve different purposes. Um, isn't high performance. Um, I guess Zephyr can be used for for high performance or high compute performance, right? If you have a dedicated um, uh, compute task at hand, that can be very high performance. But it doesn't mean you need a general purpose operating system. So as Johan mentioned, if you need real time um, and uh, just a more dedicated uh, solution, predictable. Um, with the security, but also the safety certifications, if you need a safe solution, uh, then Zephyr would be your choice. Thank you both. Um, the, I have one more question here from Guy. Is there a plan to, for creating a medium independent firmware upgrade infrastructure, whether it's over serial socket or USB? Maureen, Johan, if you have any input um, for this one. So we have support for this uh, simple management protocol uh, provided by the uh, MCU manager in Zephyr. And uh, that one already supports a couple of transports. I was just trying to look up the page for that. So there, there's a page in the Zephyr documentation that outlines what you can do with that. And, and firmware upgrade is definitely one of the use cases 
uh, for it. I, there was actually a question earlier, um, similar to device management, and I provided the link there. So somebody might be able to find it there in the answered questions. Here I found it, I think. MC Boot also supports, uh, say, the, the feature, the notion of uh, firmware updates. Um, so it uh, manages two flash blocks. Uh, so you always have a fallback option. Um, but we don't have uh, things like, like remote management uh, or infrastructure for updating many devices. Uh, but yeah. There's several ways of updating these for firmware. Great, thanks uh, everyone. Well, that is a wrap. Uh, speakers, thank you for your time and walking us through these uh, developments on the project. And for all of you, thank you be for being part of the community and to keep the uh, developing the great products using Zephyr. So with that, uh, we'll see you in the next Zephyr Summit. Thanks, Marta. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.